This evening, as I mentioned this morning, we're going to be returning to Ephesians chapter 2 and looking at a very familiar passage that tells us what our condition was like prior to Christ, tells us what changed our condition, and um, that wasn't changed by us, it was changed by God. And that is what will give us confidence as we go out to evangelize that there will be those who are saved because it really ultimately doesn't depend upon us but it depends upon God who is pleased to show mercy when and where he wills. So let me read for you Ephesians 2 uh, verses 1 through 10 again to get the text as it were back up into our minds. And again, I'll just remind you of something that's very obvious. What Paul talks about here is true. It's true. It's real. This is the way things are. This is the reason why you're saved and the reason why anyone will be saved because of God's mercy. This is what Paul writes. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, He might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this evening. Now, what we saw again this morning, as I already mentioned, has a very clear application to evangelism. Remember, we saw that the one who created the world came into the world, but the world refused to recognize him. The world refused to receive him. Even his own would not receive him. But there were those who did. And it wasn't because of any ability that they had. It was purely because of God's mercy. Now, when we think about the subject of evangelism, we need to think about the different things that actually stand in our way. What are the things we're afraid of when it comes to sharing the gospel with others? Well, again, I think some of us are afraid that we're not going to be able to do an adequate job. We're not going to be able to explain it well enough. And perhaps, well, we might ruin somebody's only opportunity to hear the gospel. Or maybe we're afraid that as we come to them and we share that maybe they know something about us that isn't consistent with the gospel. Maybe they're going to look at us as being hypocrites or at least being insincere. Or maybe we don't do it because we just don't want to do it because we're not spiritually strong. We've been spending too much time pursuing the things of the world and not pursuing the things of God that actually build us up. But I do think that most of us don't want to do this because we know what's going to happen when we do. We know that those we speak with aren't going to like what we have to say. We know that they're going to get angry at us. As a matter of fact, this morning we saw that, as a matter of fact, they will. And we also saw why. It's because of their heart condition. Because everyone in the world, in the same way that we used to, hate God. And because they hate him, they're going to hate you. Now, that is a very real concern. We're actually going to look at what we might do about that this evening. But isn't another reason why we shun evangelism, isn't it because we believe that ultimately what we're doing isn't going to make any difference? We're going to share the gospel, we're going to subject ourselves to the hatred of others and that it's all really going to come to nothing because no one's going to be saved through our witness anyway. 
Well, let's be encouraged by what we saw this morning, this, the, the second point, that because of God's grace and because of His work, there are going to be some that will receive Him. In other words, you can know that as you go out with the gospel to witness to others, your evangelism is going to be successful. Now, that's really what Paul tells us in our text this evening, because I want you to notice he does point to what your condition used to be when you came into the world, but also to the fact that God changed you. He didn't leave you as you were. God, in His mercy, quickened you to life. I mean, this tells us that God is, as a matter of fact, at work in the world. He is changing hearts every day through the gospel. And this should give all of us confidence that when we evangelize, some will be saved. Now, that's really what I would like for us to look at this evening. Now, the first thing I want to do is remind you what Paul reminds you of in this text. And that is what you were like when you came into this world. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, he's not saying you were physically dead. I mean, when you were born, when you came into this world, you began to really live for the first time in your life. You were alive physically. But you were not alive spiritually. You weren't because of what we saw this morning. Like David, you were conceived and born in sin. And the reason you were was because of Adam's choice in the garden, his representation of you, his choice, his sin was credited to you and you came into the world dead. That's the reason why when you came into the world, you came into the world loving sin. That's why as against parents, we need to teach our children to do what's right, not what's wrong. They automatically do what's wrong. It's because of sin. They love sin. They hate God, which is why no one coming into this world, including you, had any desire to get to know Him. You, you wonder why it is unbelievers don't want to know God and don't want to hear about the gospel? It's because they hate God, because they love sin. And because of that condition, you know there was nothing that you could do to please Him, nothing you could do to save yourself, nothing you could do really even to prepare yourself for salvation. That's why, Paul says, you live the way that you lived. In verses 2 and 3, you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You were going the way the rest of the world was going, doing the same things. What direction are they going? According to the prince of the power of the air. They're following Satan and doing what Satan would have them to do. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And notice Paul doesn't say it was just you Ephesians and it wasn't just us here. But it was everyone. It came into the world. And Paul even includes himself and those who were with him. He says, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. Indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. This is the way that, that we were living coming into the world. You weren't making the choices that you make now. The kind of choices you know are pleasing to God because they're according to His Word. The kind of choices you make because you love Him, you were doing what you wanted to do. You were doing what you felt like doing because it felt good. That's essentially what it means to live according to the flesh, to live according to the desires of the flesh, to do it because it feels good. You are letting those desires dictate how you live rather than God's word. Now, Paul says when you live that kind of life, you were far from God. You were under the sentence of eternal death. Again, he says in verse 3, you were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. In other words, that was your nature. You were nothing but flesh. All you wanted to do was sin. So you were a child of God's wrath by nature, even as the rest of the world, before the Lord had mercy on you. But the point is, that's what you were. But that's not what you are now. You're not like that any longer because God is merciful. Paul writes in verses 4 through 5 this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, 
even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Now again, as I mentioned this morning, this is a hard pill for many Christians today to swallow. It was God who made the difference, not you. Notice it's not, but you saw your need and reached out to God, but God, being rich in mercy when you were dead, made you alive. Now again, we're not talking about who it is that provided salvation. We know that only God could provide salvation. We're talking about who gave you the ability to receive the salvation you have. It wasn't you. You didn't come into the world with that ability. It's not because you were frightened by what you read in the Bible or by what you heard uh, the evangelists say. It wasn't because you saw your danger. It wasn't because, because you sensed your need of Jesus Christ that you reached out and took hold of him, turned from your sins and trusted him. Now, you did these things, but you didn't do them in your own power. Because again, of what Paul says here, you were dead, spiritually dead. You hated God. You hated his laws. They weren't exactly your cup of tea. They're not what you wanted to do. You wanted to do what your flesh wanted to do. You didn't want to do what God wanted. You couldn't bring yourself to submit to them, as we saw Paul say in Romans 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They are hostile toward God. You weren't seeking God. You could do nothing to please him because you didn't want to please him. You wanted to please yourself. In the flesh, there was nothing you could do to change your situation. You couldn't do it. But God could and God did. And he did it through the gospel. When you heard the gospel, God made it powerful to save you. That's the reason, again, why you're here this evening. Paul writes in Romans 1.16... For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Paul said he wasn't ashamed of it because he knew it was what God uses to save. He knew that God made it powerful by his Holy Spirit to save. God works through the gospel, but it's God who works. He works sovereignly, which is why Paul says in verse 6 that he raised us up with him. He raised us up with Christ in his mercy and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now again, we saw this morning that God does this through his spirit. The spirit works through the gospel. He doesn't work just as it were in, in the empty air and uh, just zapping people as they're walking down the street. God wants to know when people's lives are changed, why they're changed, which is why he does it under the preaching of the gospel. When the Spirit of God works through the gospel, he basically baptizes you into Christ, causing you to be born again. This is how God raises you from the dead. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, once the Spirit of God does that through the gospel, once he baptizes you into Christ, once you are in Christ, then whatever Jesus Christ went through on earth, he went through for you. In other words, whatever he did is now true of you. When he died, Paul says, you died with him on the cross. When he was buried, you were buried with him. And when he was raised from the dead, you were also raised from the dead with him now to live a new kind of life. This is what it means or what Paul means when he says that he made us alive together with Christ. Paul says in Romans 6 verses 3 and 4, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. You know, once we're in Jesus Christ, not only did we die with him, not only were we buried with him and raised with him, but Paul says we were actually ascended into heaven with him. 
and we are seated with him in heaven. Uh, Notice what he says in verse 6 of Ephesians 2. He says, you are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. He says, as a matter of fact, that's where you are right now. Now, are we all seated in heaven, literally? No. But we are united to Christ, who is at the right hand of God, who is seated in heaven, so that we are, in principle, actually seated in heaven with him, because we are in Christ. In Christ, we are made new creatures. In Christ, everything, old things have passed away, everything has become new. We are a part of the new creation. Because you are united with Jesus Christ, God considers, and you can consider as well, heaven basically to be a done deal. You are going to be there. Uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 through 30, this passage here not only tells us that we will not fall away from God, but it does tell us, actually even using the past tense, It tells us that we're already glorified. We're already, again, Paul tells us we're already seated with Christ in the heavenly places. He tells us here, we're already glorified with him. Notice what he says here. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Paul here, I believe, is referring to everyone that God foreknew and determined. And foreknowledge here, remember, is not, is not just that God foresees what we're going to do, because if that's all it was to it, God would foresee that we do nothing but sin, because that's all we can do apart from his grace. I mean, remember what we were like apart from the grace of God. But what it means is his foreknowledge is for loving us, whom he foreloved, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, which means he predetermined that we would become like Jesus. That change begins in this life. It doesn't start when we get to heaven, but that's the way we know that we know him is the fact that we're being conformed to the image of the son. We're becoming like him so that Jesus himself would be the firstborn among many brethren who are like him. But these whom he predetermined to become like his son, he called outwardly by the gospel and inwardly by the Holy Spirit. And of course, once they're quickened to life and they trust in Jesus, they're justified. And those who are justified are so certain to arrive in heaven that Paul says they are, that we are already glorified. Again, using the same kind of concept he's using here in Ephesians chapter 2. And again, I want you to notice from these verses, there is no slippage from one group to the next. All whom he foreknew, he predestined. All whom he predestined, he called. All whom he called, he justified. All whom he justified, he glorified. If you're in the beginning, if you're at the outset, if God has foreloved you, he will bring you all the way to glorification. But again, we're not in heaven Yet, we're still here on earth, we're worshiping the Lord in what we might call a a type of heaven, Uh, the Sabbath, which is a a picture of what we're going to be doing in heaven, worshiping the Lord, which is what we're going to be doing in heaven. But one day, we actually will be there. God is going to bring us there. It's an absolute certainty. And when He does, He has something else in store for us. And Paul tells us about it in verse 7. He says, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God is already revealing his his kindness to us on earth by the things that he is allowing us to do, the blessings he's given to us. But yet he has more in store for us in heaven. When he actually brings us there, he is going to reveal to us from age to age all of his love for us. That's... Tremendously encouraging because we know that we don't deserve any of this love. We did nothing to attract God's attention. We did nothing to deserve his, his attention, his love, and, and his mercy toward us in Jesus Christ. It's something that he sovereignly did of his own good pleasure. And yet, when we get to heaven, God is going to continue to reveal more and more of that love throughout eternity. He says, even forever, in the ages to come, that he might show this surpassing riches of his grace in kindness 
toward us in Christ. Now again, God did this. You didn't change your heart and make yourself come to Him. You didn't open your eyes. You were blind apart from His grace. God did this. Verses 4 and 5, let me remind you, but God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And then Paul comes back to that theme in just a couple of verses, reminding us it was purely by the grace of God. It had nothing to do with you and your works. He says in verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That faith is not something that comes from you, but something that comes from Him. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, not because of what you did, so that no one may boast. If everybody had the ability to exercise faith, and some did and some didn't, then they would have at least that much to boast in. I trusted Christ and you didn't, you know. I saw my need, but no, no, that's not what he's saying here. You were dead. You hated God. You wanted nothing to do with him. But God in his mercy made you alive, gave you faith. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of works. Even the ability to believe in him is a gift of his grace. It's not something you would have done in your dead state. It's one of those many blessings that God gives to you when he brings you to himself. He not only gives you faith, but he also gives you the ability to do what it is he calls you to do and to want to do it. That's really what gives you the ability. He gives you the desire to want to do this. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now again, here, here's the point. Okay, you were dead but God made you alive. You were his enemies, but he had mercy on you and he made you his friends. That can give you confidence in your evangelism because what the Lord has done for you, and again, look at your own life as a living testimony of what God is able to do. What he has done for you, he can and will do for others. So let's apply this now to evangelism. And again, uh, there's two things we want to see. And again, the two things we, we see in our text and the two things we saw this morning, our condition before we came to Christ and, and really how that condition conditions the response of those that we're bringing the gospel to, but also the confidence that God is going to work to bring people to himself. First of all, understanding that what Paul says here is true you and I do need to realize that the fear that we may have in evangelism, the fears, actually fears, aren't completely unfounded. Because the people that you are trying to reach with the gospel really do hate God. And they will also hate you for telling them the truth. That is the nature of our audience. Now, they're going to get along fine with you as long as you don't bring up Christ, as long as you don't try to talk to them about the gospel, they'll be fine. But when you do... Don't expect them to congratulate you. <laughs> Don't expect them to pat you on the back and shake your hand. Expect that they're going to get angry because that is the way people respond to the gospel. Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, verses 18 through 19, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. So that's the world's predisposition towards you as you come to them in the first place. They already hate you. They hate you because you're like Jesus, and they're going to hate you even more when you bring the gospel to them. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 through 12, to encourage him because Timothy is going through this very thing. He says, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
Did the Jews congratulate Paul when he brought the gospel to them? Did they shake his hand and say, thank you, well done, Paul. Uh, thank you for bringing the gospel to me. And did the Gentiles do this? He, no, he, he has really a quite lengthy catalog of sufferings that he had to endure for doing this very work. I mean, just read 2 Corinthians. But even here we have sort of a truncated list in 2 Timothy. What persecutions I endured... For doing what? For being the world's friend? No. For sharing the gospel with people who didn't want to hear it. And yet, he says, out of them all, the Lord rescued me. The Lord was faithful. He delivered Paul out of these things, even though it meant he would have to suffer for it. And he goes on to say, that's not just for me. It's not just because I'm an apostle. It's not just because I've been given this task by God. He says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. <clears throat> Which means when you go out to evangelize, you do need to brace yourself. You do need to prepare yourself. You are going to be hated. It is part of the cost of evangelizing. But now, knowing that that's true, you also need to make sure that it's the gospel that actually offends others and that you're not bringing unnecessary offense because that can happen too, right? If you approach them in the way that the Lord tells you to approach them, not in a judgmental and condescending and condemning spirit, but rather in a spirit of love and gentleness with a genuine desire to try to help them find their way to Jesus Christ, your chances of success are going to be, I believe, much greater. I mean, just picture a Pharisee going out to evangelize, as it were, versus somebody who is humble, like the tax gatherer in the temple, which one are you going to be more likely to respond to if they come to you with something you really don't want to hear? A spirit of humility, gentleness, uh, makes a big difference. Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, verses 14 through 16, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. So if you do come in a spirit of gentleness and reverence, that's first of all what you should be doing. But in the end, those who falsely accuse you, Peter says, will in the end be put to shame. Now if you do approach them in this way, if you do approach them in love and they still get angry, again, don't you get angry. Okay, don't retaliate. You know, we're all tempted to give an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Don't return injury for injury. But bear their abuses patiently and in love. Now, how can you do that? Well, you can only do it in love, right? You can only do it through love. I mean, how is it that, uh, that anyone can bear the offenses of anyone else? How can a husband bear the offenses of a wife or a wife a husband or parents children or children parents? How are we able to do that and stick together? Well, it's only because of love. You see, if you... If you love someone and you don't respond in hatred, if they happen to hate you, then the likelihood of what you have said and how you've conducted yourself, you know, this, this example you've given to them, besides the words you've spoken, also the fact that you haven't behaved the way that they have, you haven't responded in hatred to their hatred, those things will stay with them. Those things will be a witness that the Lord can use. Again, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, verse 12, he says, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of his visitation. You see, your witness, the way you conduct yourself, will, will even have a, a lasting effect. It may be the thing that the Lord uses to bring them to himself. So do expect that people aren't, aren't going to be necessarily happy when you bring the gospel to them, but make sure you bring it in the right way so you don't bring unnecessary offense and make sure that when they do get angry that you respond in love. 
so that you leave them with a lasting witness. You know, really, it's the people who get the most angry <laughs> at sharing the gospel with them. They're the ones that usually are most affected by what you have to say. The people that are indifferent are the ones that are least affected. So, in some sense, this is almost a good thing that they get angry because what you're saying is getting through. But second, and this is the encouraging thing, know that the Lord will use your witness to bring others to himself. Uh, in John chapter 10, verses 14 through 16, uh, we do have some encouraging words here that has to do, again, with God's sovereignty. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Now let's think about this for a minute and maybe you can keep this text on the screen. He says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Now what he means is that, you know, so far he's gathered Jews to himself. He has other sheep not of this fold. He's referring to the Gentiles. He's referring to you if you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking about all of those who are yet to be called. He says regarding them, they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Now, how do we know that's true? Well, you heard his voice and you were saved. They can hear it and they can be saved as well. But how are they going to hear his voice? Well, the way they're going to hear it is through you because you are the ones that Jesus has commissioned to bring the gospel to others, all of us here that know the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You are his witnesses. That's the reason why the Lord gave you his spirit, was so that you might become like him, so that you could witness for him by the power of your life and the power of your words. He said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven in Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And as to the fact that Jesus was not referring just to his apostles because it was just the 11 with him at that time, and that it applied to all of his disciples. We know that when the Spirit of God was poured out on the day of Pentecost, it was poured out on the 120 who had gathered together for prayer as they were seeking the Lord for this blessing. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now we do realize the tongues were a witness for the unbelieving Jews that were present. That's exactly what Paul says they were for in 1 Corinthians 14 which is why it took place here on the day of Pentecost. But notice they were all filled with the Holy Spirit to empower them to be the Lord's witnesses. That is why he has given his Holy Spirit to give us the power to be his witnesses. Now Jesus says in John 10 verse 16, they will hear my voice and they will become one flock with one shepherd, which means that as you go in the power of the Holy Spirit to evangelize to others, some will hear Jesus speaking through you and they will believe in him and turn from their sins and they will enter into his flock. They will become one body with you. They will enter his church and they will submit to Jesus as their head. The Spirit will open their eyes. He will open their ears. They will receive Jesus Christ. You can be sure that they will because God said that he would do it. 
So all this is to say that the doctrine of God's sovereignty, the doctrine of election, doesn't kill evangelism. It doesn't stop it dead in its tracks, as many well-meaning Christians actually believe. But rather, it's the only grounds upon which we can actually evangelize. The only reason why anyone is going to be saved. I mean, think about this for a minute. Understanding what the nature of man is from the scriptures, if you went out to share the gospel with them, uh, what would be the hope that any of them are going to be saved if it depended upon them? We could have no hope that any would be saved. But with the promise that God is at work, then you can know, you can expect, you can believe there are going to be those who will be converted. As a matter of fact, the greatest evangelists who have ever lived believed in the sovereignty of God. And they didn't do their work in spite of God's sovereignty. They did their work because of His sovereignty. They went out going, or they, they went out knowing that when they shared the gospel, there would be those who would be saved. They were sure of it. And that's why they went. And the point is, God's sovereignty should encourage your evangelism as well. It shouldn't kill it. It's the assurance that God is going to bring his sheep to himself. Let me just close with a quote from the Puritan Thomas Goodwin. I, let's see, I think this one, yes, is in your bulletin at the very bottom. He says, Oh, despise not election. Therein lies all your hope that there is a remnant who shall infallibly be saved. It's, see, it's that hope that sends us out there, armed with the gospel, because we know God will work through it to bring the lost to faith in himself. So let the sovereignty of God encourage you. Be prepared because of the condition of man. Be prepared to, to suffer what you need to suffer for doing this, but realize that it won't be for no purpose. It won't be for no reason. God will use all that you go through to bring his sheep to himself. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, again, apply what we've heard uh, to our lives as we need to hear it.